immediately recognized the name A. Nico Everman. He was, in fact, a pioneer of computer science and the founding dean of the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. We name our distinguished lecturers in computer science after Dean Hammerman in honor of his significant contributions to the field. Today's speaker is herself a pioneer in computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Mary Shaw was one of the first PhD graduates in computer science at CMU. Upon her graduation, Professor jo uh, Shaw joined the faculty, and today she is the Alan J. Perlitt University Professor of Computer Science in the Institute for Software Research, one of the longest serving faculty members at the university. You might think that the trade university professor is redundant. It is the highest rank that we have at this university with fewer than 20 people holding that. Professor Shaw is a leader in software engineering research, whose work on software architecture helped establish it as a recognized discipline. Selecting an appropriate architecture is now recognized as a critical step in the engineering of complex software systems. She is also an educational innovator who has developed computer science curricula from the introductory to the doctoral level. During her tenure, she has served as chief scientist at Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute and as associate dean for professional education. Professor Shaw has received the United States National Medal of Technology and Innovation and is the co-recipient of the 2011 Outstanding Research Award from the Association of Computing Machinery Special Interest Group on Software Engineering for Contribution to Software Architecture. She was the first recipient of the Distinguished Educator Award presented by the IEEE's Technical Council on Software Engineering and the first recipient of the Nancy Award for Excellence in Software Engineering Education. She is a fellow of the ACM, IEEE, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Mary's talk today is Progress Towards an Engineering Discipline in Software. We're very <coughs> fortunate to have Professor Shaw with us today. And please join me in welcoming her to Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you very much. Uh, is mic good? The mic's good. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, this is my first trip to, uh, to Qatar and indeed to the Middle East, and I have to say I'm having a wonderful time. Um, I, was, I was privileged to know Nico Haberman. I worked with him uh, off and on for many years. Uh, he and uh, uh, Angel Jordan, our former provost, um, and Mario Babacci and I and a couple of other people uh, wrote the proposal that led to bringing the Software Engineering Institute to Pittsburgh. Um, and so we were all very deeply embroiled in, in uh, um, not only uh, Software Engineering as a discipline, but in, in trying to bring the Software Engineering Institute for its role in helping to transfer the things that we were learning out into the software industry. So uh, um, I, I want to personally honor Nico at this, at this juncture. Um, as, partly as a result of the Software Engineering Institute experience, uh, I started thinking about the fact that we were calling this discipline software engineering, but we weren't being very careful about what it meant to be an engineering discipline. And so at some point I, I spent about a semester reading history of engineering and, and tried to understand how engineering disciplines evolve, and what it might mean for software engineering to become one. So that's my subject today. Uh, what does it mean to be an engineering discipline, and uh, how, how are we making progress toward that end? What do we need to do next? I'm going to do this by telling a story. Uh, I'm going to tell essentially the same story twice. I'm going to tell it once for civil engineering, so that we can see how civil engineering <coughs> evolved. And I'm going to tell the story again for software engineering, which is closer to home for us and therefore a little bit more difficult to stand back and, and get distance and perspective. Um, and in, in this, the, the domain of civil engineering, I'm going to focus on bridges. Uh, in the domain of software engineering, I'm going to focus on software architecture, because uh, that's what I know and love. So um, engineering. If you go in and look at definitions of engineering, you'll find a big pile of definitions of engineering. And if you put them all in a, in, in a pile and stand back and spin, uh, you'll see that they all have these things in common. Engineering is about cost-effective solutions. 
uh, cost-effective solutions to practical problems. Uh, the definitions say that you get these solutions by applying scientific knowledge, building things, and in the service of mankind. And those, those clauses all pretty much appear. Um, and so you see there that engineering is a pragmatic, fact-based approach to solving problems, not an ad hoc, really know approach. But there's a discrepancy between these definitions and what I see happening in practice. Um, and that is this word scientific knowledge. Engineers will turn to formally demonstrated scientific knowledge when they have it available. But if they don't have it available, they don't throw up their hands in the air and say, I can't do engineering. Um, they will look for the best codified knowledge available. And there's kind of a fallback where you go from validated science to empirical work to lots of experience to good engineering judgment to looking at prior examples. So you get the best knowledge that you can, but you, 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 you don't say, I can only do this if I have the science. Um, and so it, engineering is a way of using that codified knowledge to help ordinary people do things that would otherwise require virtuosos. Uh, engineering is characterized by uh, constraints, uh, limited time, limited knowledge, and limited resources, all force decisions on trade-offs. You can't have it all. You've got to choose what you want most. Um, as I said, the engineers use the best knowledge available, um, and that shapes their design decisions. Engineers transmit this knowledge through reference materials, and classically engineering uses handbooks, big fat handbooks, uh, that are issued every 10 or 15 years, which works for them. I'll come back to that. And uh, in common engineering practice calls for doing a design early, a partial design, analyzing that design to predict the properties of the product that will happen if you implement the design, and then using that analysis to re refine the design um, and, and proceed through more design stages before you actually start investing in, in ordering steel beams and, and important concrete. Now, engineering disciplines evolve something along the following way. There's a technology that is important uh, because people need it for something. Um, and initially, it's, a, it's practiced as a craft. There are not dedicated professionals. Knowledge is transmitted informally. There's local, local production for local use. So think about community barn raisings. Uh, think about burning a pile of dirt under ashes to get alkali for whatever you use alkali for, uh, glass making, for example. But at some point, that becomes sufficiently useful and sufficiently important uh, that local production isn't good enough anymore. Perhaps you have to uh, front the resources to buy materials. Uh, perhaps you have to do marketing, perhaps you do have to do transportation, uh, and the payback doesn't come back until after it's done. And so at this point, uh, you need uh, some production and management techniques um, to, to keep everything organized and keep it on track. And when those two things merge, then you can have a commercial practice that exploits the technology, not as pure local craft, uh, but as business. Now the business, um, let's see. So. You, you need both the production uh, uh, techniques and the technology, uh, then you build a business on it. As you practice the business, you'll run into problems. And those problems generate questions that often stimulate the science. This is certainly how chemistry got started. Um, the science starts to answer those questions, it improves business practice, uh, and there's crosstalk back and forth. Uh, Business, the, the business practice contributing questions um, and the science contributing answers back. And there's, there's a cycle that, that leads to the progressive codification that eventually yields science. And then at some point, um, they evolve to where you can get a systematic uh, 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 business of engineering where you, uh, you use your scientific foundations um, and you can make um, uh, deliberate designs with, and, and with expected outcomes. So, so that's the story that I'm going to tell. So we'll begin with civil engineering, um, and in particular, uh, bridges and arches. You can imagine how craft practice might have started with uh, um, emulating things that you had seen in nature. 
um, and building them pretty much ad hoc. Uh, indeed, the Romans held together an empire uh, based on roads and bridges. Uh, this, is, this is a pair of Roman aqueducts. One of the things that you see in, in the Roman practice uh, is that they'll build something out and you can see from the, uh, from the evidence behind that, that there was a failure uh, and that the failure was repaired and that the, the repair was incorporated in the design of subsequent spans or arches or, or panels or, or whatever the thing that you're building. So the, the Romans didn't, as far as we can tell, uh, do any deliberate application of mathematics to determine the sizes or shapes of things. But they had a lot of practice on which they could build. Uh, not terribly much theory, but they developed construction methods that actually persisted well into the 19th century. Um, and in, at the 19th century, we had big power machinery that enabled things that you couldn't do by hand. But the Roman techniques persisted pretty much until then. Uh, about 25 before our current epoch, um, a Roman named Vitruvius wrote a book called The Five Books of Architecture. What was it The Seven Books of Architecture? Um, in translation, in English, it's about a half an inch thick, so these were not very big books. Uh, this was um, not an engineering handbook, it was a documentation of things that he sort of understood. So there's a, there's a section about how you build walls that are stone on the outside with rubble on the inside. There's a section on how you tune an amphitheater by putting bronze pots in just the right place to, to help the acoustics. There's a section on how you lay out the streets of your, your village so that the evil miasmas from the local swamp don't make everyone sick. But that's, that's the state of codification at this point in time. Then over time, if you look at the profiles of bridges, time, time moves vertically here from, from top to bottom. If you look at the designs of bridges, you'll see that over time they become lacier. The spans become longer, the arches become flatter, uh, the amount of uh, uh, free space under the bridge gets larger. There are actually, there's an actual index called the boldness index <coughs> that combines these things to measure this. Um, and so over time, uh, largely empirically, um, the, you, you see these refinements. Um, and in addition to, 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 to that, uh, people could write down their rules of thumb. So here's a, a, a diagram by Alberti that, that says, here are the proportions of the bridges that I build. Um, it's a little hard to parse, so let me help you. Uh, here's the river bottom. And then these are pilings in the river bottom. Uh, there's a dimension uh, D, and the, the, the footing is twice that dimension, and so forth and so on. So here is the water. There is the bridge deck. Uh, and you have formulas like the height is, uh, is d over 4. And, you know, within some range of scalability, uh, this is his rule of thumb about how to build a bridge. Now, you understand that, that if it gets too big, it doesn't work. But, but for the work, for projects he was working on, this was the way he transmitted his, his uh, rule of thumb knowledge about building bridges. Um, bridges were made out of stone or possibly wood until 1779 when the first iron bridge was built at Col Colbert Vale in England, it was made of cast iron. And you'll see in this bridge, which still stands today, by the way, uh, I was there about five or 10 years ago. Um, you'll see in this bridge, the design of the stone arch bridge. Uh, this often happens when you introduce a new technology is that you use the old designs and try out the new technology and the old designs. And then you learn something about the properties of materials and you can make designs uh, that exploit the properties of the new materials uh, that you couldn't exploit uh, in, the, in the old materials. So iron bridges were built for a while, and in 1847, uh, they were all over England, uh, and there was on the D bridge a failure. Um, there was a series of failures, but this, this was kind of the big one that set things off. Uh, the failures always happened when there was a train on the bridge, which made them more dire. It led uh, the ruler to appoint a commission of inquiry, and the commission of inquiry essentially discovered metal fatigue. Uh, discovered also that cast iron and wrought iron had different properties, um, and led to a, a, a series of things involving uh, inspections and standards and changes in materials. 
Um, so in the Renaissance through the Industrial Revolution, we had increasingly long spans, rules of thumb about proportions, uh, some explanation of structures, uh, the introduction of cast iron, and subsequently wrought iron, and then steel, and then reinforced concrete <coughs> as new materials in bridge building. So as you follow along with me, um, we have this little picture. Uh, and so here we have a commercial practice of bridges. Uh, and we'll have these little guys cueing us as to where we are in the story as we go along. Making this happen, getting, getting to a scientific practice, involves solving a couple of fundamental problems. One was the composition of forces. Uh, we know now that you add vectors, but, but they didn't know that then. Uh, and the other was the, the problem of what happens uh, when you cantilever a beam and look at how it bends. And those were solved by the theory of statics in the late 17th century and the strength of materials in the early 18th century. So, you know, right around that time is the cusp where we, where we brought uh, science <coughs> to the engineering path. Uh, the hardest problem for them was actually identifying the concept. You know, they, they <coughs> it, it took some work to figure out exactly what the concept of force ought to be. And this was enabled by, by the new mathematics of the calculus, which was, of course, built on older mathematics from this region, the algebra. Uh, but that brought us uh, enough science to start doing analyses. And in um, 1846 to 1850, uh, this bridge was designed, analyzed mathematically, uh, and constructed. And you'll see an engineering sense of risk management here because the, uh, the bridge piers are taller than the bridge, which allowed to install in suspension cables if it turned out that the analysis was wrong. But they did not have to install the suspension cables, so the analysis was a success. Uh, the bridge, uh, it was intended for locomotives. It takes the locomotives through the truss, and there's uh, an example cross-section uh, of the truss. Okay, moving into the early 20th century, uh, we began to have handbooks. This is from the first Iron and Steel handbook. I know you can't read it, so let's blow up a piece of it. Uh, this is a book that tabulates things that an engineer might want to know. Uh, this is about the properties of various cross sections. So here's a T-shaped beam, and here's an H-shaped beam. And there's dimensions, and then there's formulas that tell you the things that you might want to know about that beam. And I'm not going to read that all to you. I just want you to have a sense of the kind of, of uh, the vocabulary they were using to describe the materials they were working with um, and the, the level of analysis that that supported. Fast forward to the, uh, the mid 20th century. This is a pair of pages from a textbook on arch bridge design. And so now they have multiple kinds of arch bridges. Um, and they have coefficients for something that people who build arch bridges care about that I'm not going to take time to explain. But it says, um, if you're looking at this kind of bridge, this is the curve that relates uh, the properties. So now you have some real ability uh, to predict the behavior of a particular kind of bridge uh, based on, on the analysis and the data included here. So the engineering of bridges went from the theory of statics around 1700, the tabulations of properties of materials to 1750, uh, another 100 years for the formal analysis of the bridge structure. Um, that kind of got worked out around 1900, some systematic theory around 1950. Um, so now, now we have professional engineering. And uh, currently, we have a design automation um, in, in my state, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Department of Transportation requires the use of a particular software package for the automated design of simple bridges. Not the big complicated bridges across gorges, but, but Pittsburgh has something like 3,000 simple bridges that cross creeks and roads and railroad tracks and gullies and, and all kinds of other things. Um, and they're, they're simple bridges, they're single span, they're not very complicated, uh, but the, the, the analysis of those is now automated and if you're building one of these, you're expected to use it. And it's a sort of software package that you could expect. Uh, this is from a PowerPoint uh, about it. Engineering input comes in, design drawings goes out. Um, and you see some of the, the things you do about making design choices. Um, 
what kind of, uh, you know, are you going to use a block scheme or are you going to use something else? And you take these things off and then turn the crank and, and designs come out. Isn't that fun? So there we have a, a quick tour of civil engineering. Uh, we began to get the science in the 1700s. Uh, the Romans were, were doing it around the first century. And then you can date the emergence of, of professional engineering to maybe 1750 with properties of materials or maybe 1850 uh, with a bridge design. You can see it wasn't real fast. Uh, but communication wasn't real fast then either. And the technology wasn't moving real fast. So that's how an engineering discipline <coughs> like uh, civil engineering evolves. Let's look at software engineering. Well, first let me position software engineering as engineering. Uh, here's the definition of engineering from, from earlier. And I'll warp that just a little bit. So software engineering is the branch of computer science, and I'm positioning software engineering as part of computer science. Here at Carnegie Mellon, we, we take computer science to be the entirety of the study of the phenomena surrounding computers. We take the big tent view of computer science. And so this position, software engineering, is part of computer science that does that are cost-effective solutions to practical problems, computing problems as it happens, by applying codified knowledge, developing software systems in the service of mankind. Okay, I can, I can place software engineering as engineering. But there are a couple of differences uh, between software and bridges. One is that software is design intensive. Most of the labor that goes into a software system is the effort that's devoted to designing the system. You don't have to call out bulldozers and trains and spill beans to produce the system, uh, you write an install file and put it out on the internet. So the, the balance of effort is shifted. And don't let that fool you. Um, second is that uh, software is, is uh, abstract, um, it's symbolic, and it's constrained more by its complexity than it is by the, the limitations of the materials themselves. It's still constrained by those things, but the constraints come from different places. So be careful about mapping software engineering to other engineering. Uh, it is still, I believe, uh, pers prospectively, um, an engineering discipline. The problems are comparable, but, but don't do things like saying, well, look at where all the time is going. We need to manage programmers like we used to manage drafts. Um, or rivet setters, um, and, and that's, that's driven by these two observations. So software engineering itself, um, we date it to 1968, almost 50 years ago. That's not much time in, in the history of, of, of a discipline. Uh, there was a conference sponsored by NATO in 1968 that was called uh, to bring people together to talk about how awful the software development problem is. And so this title was coined as an aspiration, not as a description. And what we're talking about today is how close we're coming to a description. I'll note in passing that there are uh, some reports that the phrase software engineering was actually used by Margaret Hamilton um, in a little bit earlier in connection with, uh, with some NASA work. Um, it, it was really the NATO conferences that brought the phrase into common use. But I do want to credit Margaret Hamilton as, as in, in all likelihood, an earlier user of the phrase. Uh, so here we are uh, standing on craft practice saying, what do we do next? And uh, if, you, if you go and read these, there are things that will actually sound familiar. Um, software is fine in many areas, but it's not really great for life critical applications. Uh, there's a widening gap between our aspirations and our achievements. Software is late, over cost estimate, doesn't meet its specifications. So that way in 1968, uh, you'll still hear those things said now. So uh, here's a sample of a kind of a diagram that was uh, in the NATO report. Um, it says, here are the, the traditional concepts of programming cover just the implementation bit. But in fact, the responsibilities uh, of the programmers, think software developers, cover every, everything from um, early analysis through design down to lifetime maintenance. 
I think we're doing better in this respect. Now let's look at this aspect, production techniques. Uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s, uh, a lot of energy went into devising uh, software development methods and software management techniques of various kinds. Uh, a sampling of the, of the labels that you may recognize are structured programming, waterfall models, uh, incremental <coughs> development, cost of schedule estimation, process maturity, agility, and things like that. Uh, this is not the subject of my talk. It could be the subject of a different talk, but I want to position that as having provided uh, this expertise that's required to move forward to commercial practice. So now we talk about commerce driving science. The challenges in commercial practice are things like um, safety critical tasks, dealing with large systems, concurrency, very large state spaces, um, many different versions, huge data sets, um, and, and adaptive systems. Those are kind of typical problems that you would face in commercial practice. And from those, we have got theories that support things like safety analysis, architectural patterns, parallel logics, model checking, program families, map reduced scalability, uh, and a model for adaptive systems called the MATE model that I'm not going to talk about today, that's a talk of its own. Uh, so you'll see that, that there has been responsiveness uh, in this dialogue between the development theory and the commercial practice. And so that is a good thing, and many of these things are, are fairly new. Uh, one of the ways that I measure progress is by, you know, lines that go up and to the right, because lines that go up and to the right are obviously good. Uh, but I measure uh, progress by the increasing scale of the abstractions that we use as common vocabulary. That is, the, the, the intellectual size of the chunk that you don't need to look inside of. So in 1950, these were macros and subroutines, and uh, now we're doing domain platforms and, and cloud computing, and, and a single line of writing can invoke a huge body um, of prepackaged expertise. So this is, this, this is a measure of leverage. You'll hear people talking about lines of code. Um, this is the leverage that one line of code will give you, and that, and that grows substantially over time. We have uh, not only a vocabulary of increasing scale, but we have some fundamental ideas. Uh, we have the idea that um, abstraction is a technique that we use to control uh, the intellectual complexity of, of our, our tasks. And, and the previous slide with the scale of, of abstraction is, is showing how much leverage we're getting on that complexity. Um, we impose structure on problems. Um, <coughs> I have lost the screen here. Thank you. Um, we, we find problems that we recognize in different settings. Um, and those become our models for, for solving other problems, uh, perhaps with canonical solutions and perhaps with just enough to recognize the problem. We use symbolic representations. Um, we build precise models for analysis and prediction. And we deal with exponential growth uh, because that creates both opportunities and limits. But there's one place where we fall really short, and that is in providing design guidance. So remember the two-page spread from the, uh, the textbook on bridge superstructures and how to choose them? We really need to be able to choose among solutions to problems based on uh, properties of the problem. And here is an example of what I think is done right. The problem is that this is the best one I know, and it is dated 1971. Okay, this is the summary of a computing survey's paper on sorting, and it tells you how to choose a sorting algorithm. And I know you can't read all that, and so let's just blow up the middle. Um, this is a decision to that. Uh, you're playing 20 questions with a problem. Um, uh, is there storage available besides what the items currently occupy? If not, 
Are they long two positions out of place? Use a tree sort, um, and if you do have memory, would you make it dependent on the distribution of key values? And uh, are you going to do it on two disks? Uh, are six or fewer tapes? Uh, use a polyphase merge? Okay, so the technology is out of date a little. Uh, no one's done a six tape polyphase merge in very many years. So you don't, you don't need to study this diagram, but what you need to understand is the shape of the diagram that there are some important characteristics of the problems and that understanding what those are allows you to help someone who has a problem figure out what kind of solution he needs. And we need more stuff like this and there just isn't enough of it around. This is, to my mind, one of the chief ways in which we fail to yet be a full-fledged engineering discipline. Anyway, on to software architecture. Uh, software architecture um, is about not, not the lines of code that are in a system, but about the modules and components that are used to make up the system. It's the principal understanding of that large-scale structure of systems. And finding, as I said earlier, the, the common patterns and how you can exploit those common patterns to get predictable results. It emerged in the 1990s from pretty informal roots. Um, I spent uh, a couple of days in a conference room. I cut out the, the six column inches of a bunch of uh, papers about systems that are called the architecture of my system, and I put them in piles. Uh, I now know that I was committing grounded theory, although I didn't at the time. But I found, I found in the informal language of the authors uh, a number of patterns uh, that are interesting and useful and still persist. And that vocabulary um, is what what originally started the, the discussion of software architecture as a, as a design activity. Um, so here are some examples. This is, this is craft practice. This is 1963. It's a COBOL compiler. Uh, it's got a bunch of boxes and lines. And by golly, this one has a program transformation. Um, it says, um, you'd like to hook these two things up directly, but if your computer isn't big enough, you can put a mag tape in the middle. 1963, give me a break. Um, here is Ezra Dijkstra's THE system. Um, Ezra, by the way, was Nico Hubbard's advisor. So, so this is all in the family. Uh, this is 1968, and this was the first analysis of an operating system that said, look, we build an operating system out of layers. Um, this is uh, 1972. Uh, it's a, a sketch of the shape of the Multic system, and there's a little annotation up here that says ring zero and ring one through whatever. But if you stand back and look just a little bit, you will see that this is in fact a layered system. And although they haven't called it out explicitly, they have intuitively, ad hoc, organized their system uh, systematically into layers with different responsibilities assigned to each layer. Okay, so craft practice Software has always had structure at some time. Virtuosos um, have had good structure. Virtuosos produced layered systems before we had the concept of layered systems because it was a good way to organize things. Uh, that, and that was based on intuition and folklore and, and uh, shared guidance. Uh, in, the, uh, in the NATO 68 period, uh, computer manufacturers sold hardware that was their bread and butter in order to persuade people to buy the hardware, they bundled the software with the hardware. <coughs> okay, but the cost profile has changed. Um, yeah, at that period, we understood the structure of compilers and operating systems and not a whole lot else. Um, we had databases for accounting, but they were pretty simple databases. So moving on into commercial practice and just tracking it by the kinds of box and line diagrams that people were drawing about their system. We see things like this and things like that. You can kind of see layers here. Um, and things like this where different <coughs> components um, had different kinds of responsibilities. And that will bring us to uh, 1970s with batch processing through the 1980s with papers that talk about the architecture of my system without really having much substance about what architecture means. Um, the 1990s, where we see uh, some early systematic structure, and um, I, I date software product lines to about here. A software product line 
uh, is a collection of programs that are really similar in certain respects. They may differ in the amount of machine power they require, they may differ in the scale that they will support, um, but you think about it as a single system design that has variations, and you maintain it that way. Um, and then in the 2000s, architecture research has entered practice. We, uh, we saw first some company-specific architecture. This is how we do it here at GE. Um, this is how we do it here at NASA. And um, out of that, uh, we started growing uh, frameworks. We uh, developed UML, which is a set of notations for describing system structure, rather than code. Um, and this became the era of object-oriented programming. I think objects are one of the many interesting architectures, but, but there's a faction that thinks objects solve everything, and so we see objects everywhere. Um, and now, now we really do have um, commercial practice in software architecture. Okay, now what about simulating science? Well, we were dealing with ad hoc structure, problems of interoperability. If I get a component from here and a component from there, how do I lash them together? That's routine now, but it wasn't always routine. Uh, how do I deal with, with variants, multiple versions, um, and specialized application knowledge? Uh, so we get science such as uh, the styles and patterns for software architecture, uh, program families, product lines, and inheritance. Um, and uh, um, I think we're seeing a, a good surge in domain-specific models and languages to handle specific situations. Here's some examples of architectural idioms. There are layers like, like many of the systems that I showed pictures of. But there are different kinds of layers. Uh, virtual machines are a little bit different from client server systems. We see data flow systems. Uh, Unix pipe and filters are the, the kind of data flow system that, that people understand best. But when I look at back sequential systems of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, I see data flow there. Uh, we see interacting processes of various kinds, um, but with different flavors. And uh, this is from a paper that I wrote with Paul Clements. Don't worry about the stuff in the middle. The important part is that we were able to identify some architectures and the kind of reasoning that worked for that particular sort of architecture. So the kind of reasoning that you apply to a database where you're worried about the acid properties is different from the kind of reasoning you apply to a pipe and filter system where if you really believe it's pipe and filter and obey the rules, functional composition gives you the reasoning. But if you break the rules, that doesn't work anymore. Which is why it's important to understand what the architectures are and what the requirements are. Because if you don't satisfy the requirements, you don't get the benefit um, of the analysis that's important. So we don't have a theory of data flow uh, or any of these others at, at the level of that sort of example. But we can certainly rule out, rule, write down some rules of thumb. So if your problem can be decomposed into sequential stages, uh, consider a data flow architecture, uh, and, and on like this. And uh, we also skate on the generality power curve. So you know the generality power curve, you often get a choice between having um, lots of generality or a little specialization um, and how much power you get. So you have generic architectural styles that give you a certain amount of guidance and that works up to product lines that are uh, very narrowly applicable, but, but give you the framework for the whole system all at once. And there are some named examples that um, I won't dwell on. I just put those up there to show you that I can populate this. More recently, these diagrams look like the other ones, but something importantly different is going on. Previously, I showed you diagrams of how things work in this particular system. These are from tutorials that you can find online. Let's say, if you want to think about entering architecture, here's the generic drawing, and now go populate this yourself. If you want to think about virtual machines, here's the generic drawing, now you can go populate it yourself. And I think that's an important shift from the example to the, to the exemplar. Um, we have uh, systematically organized knowledge in the form of books. Uh, the Software Engineering Institute uh, has a, a series of, uh, of books about architectures and their analysis. Uh, the patterns community has, has a you know, stack about like this of, um, of pattern books for 
various sorts of software architectures. So we're putting, we're putting stuff in circulation. And that's speeding this move to professional engineering because we can now transmit the knowledge more systematically. OK, so where are we now? Remember the ad hoc uh, um, what was the diagram that we could see layers in, um, in the mid-range layered system and the exemplar of the layered system? Well, we have now reached a common culture. At least I'm going to pretend that XKCD, which is really a cartoon for geeks, uh, I'm going to pretend that that's common, common culture. We have now got it to where uh, common culture can make a cartoon out of a software stack. And so all of the red boxes are things that you could fill in with some other example of that particular kind of software. Man, we're there. So is it engineering? Well, remember our old friend, the D-Bridge. Uh, engineering, as I understand it, certainly as practiced in the United States, is associated with a, a commitment. It's, it's a trade between um, the engineering discipline itself and the public, in which the engineering discipline agrees that in exchange for policing entry to the discipline, it will assure the public that the practitioners will practice well. Right, so engineering is associated with a level of assurance uh, that protects the public health, safety, and welfare. It's not best effort. It's good enough. And there's a difference between I tried my best and I did well enough. So how are we doing there? Well, you know, read the headlines. Uh, last summer in the United States, Equifax is a, a credit rating agency collects all kinds of credit information, all kinds of personal information on, on everyone who has a bank account or a credit card and probably some others. And uh, they were compromised. Uh, there was a patch for a vulnerability that they didn't install for nine weeks. And then they waited another four months to tell the public. Uh, it's a few years ago now, but, but Toyota had this uh, problem with unexpected uh, acceleration. The cause seems to have been really, really lousy software development practice. And if you want to hear about that, get, get Phil Koopman to, to give that talk. Um, the payout from the original lawsuit was $1.6 billion. Um, and that may very well have, have uh, inspired other people to file more lawsuits. Um, and uh, last year sometime, with permission, uh, some hackers showed that you could, in fact, commandeer an automobile from afar, uh, which opens the door to all kinds of mischief. Not in this instance, but they showed the possibility. Well, those are old, you say. OK. Um, last month, everybody with a Wi-Fi device um, is vulnerable until they get the patch from the manufacturer uh, because of a fundamental flaw in a security protocol. Last week, Google Docs pushed a piece of push, pushed a patch out that wasn't ready for prime time, and a lot of people got locked out of the Google Docs, like uh, somebody who was writing a draft proposal that was due uh, this evening, and somebody who was uh, working with his editor on, on deadline for a newspaper article, and long litany of other people. And that's sloppiness. Um, last Friday. Estonia froze all of their national ID card because they discovered an encryption flaw uh, in the chip on the card. And that therefore, the entire population of Estonia was vulnerable to ID theft. And oh, by the way, you need the ID card if you're going to use any government services and probably some other things. Uh, so they've been having a kerfuffle for this past weekend. And ripped from the headlines um, in this morning's peninsula. <laughs> Uh, it says, uh, intensify efforts to protect information security, says PM. And their example is uh, the terrible hack that targeted the Qatar news agency last May through different fabricated and false attributing statements uh, to the Emir Sheikh uh, Fahmed bin Hamad al Thani in an attempt to harm the state of Qatar and escalate the current stage of crisis in the siege community. That's this morning. Um, so, it's not like I'm cherry picking from the last five years. All I have to do is watch the headlines. 
this says to me, we're not there yet. And the interesting thing is that many of these failures are caused by failing to do stuff that we know we should be doing. So earlier I listed some characteristics of engineering. Uh, limited time, knowledge, resources, force decisions on trade-offs. Check, got that. Uh, we use the best codified knowledge to shape design decisions. Eh, some and some. Uh, we have reference materials that make knowledge and expertise available. Eh, not yet. Um, we do analysis of design that predicts properties of the implementation. I'll give a sum and sum on that one. So this is this is my report card on how we're doing now. Um, we uh, around 1990 we had the software development methods, so so we got commercial practice then. Uh, and I think right now uh, the professional practice of engineering is emerging, but it's still spotty. So what do we do about it? Um, well, this slide I use in lots of places. You're already asking me. So you're part of it. First, I think it's important to understand that we don't get to everyone in the computer science department. So on the left, we have a scaled drawing of the highly trained professional computer scientists, and I think two million or thereabouts, and the number of end users, many of whom are doing programming-like things. They're building sophisticated spreadsheets with pivot tables. Uh, they're building database queries. They're putting macros in, in documents. Um, there's a huge number of people out there who are not getting access to the things that we know. And uh, a couple of years ago, Stack Overflow, which is uh, populated by professional and enthusiast programmers, um, asked how they got their training. Now, there were multiple answers because this adds up to more than 100%. But you will see uh, that self-taught and on the job uh, were right up there in the mix <coughs> with BS and NS and CS. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the rest is not formal academic education. So in addition to worrying about how we educate the people who actually come to us and say, let's get educated, we need to worry about how to either educate all the rest or give them tools that are more foolproof to the tools we're giving them now. Um, everybody's online. Uh, the Pew Foundation runs a project called the Internet in American Life that looks at uh, the way adults in, America, in the United States um, use the Internet. Uh, again, um, you can't read that. Um, this is the line of 50% population, and this is about eight years old, and I just saw that the number of adults over 65 is now exceeding 50%. I mean, there's a pipeline, right, because people don't stop using it. And so this is the kinds of things they do. The one, the one that's really scary is actually the, second, the third line. Number one is email, number two is search, number three is health information. Um, and I just kind of tagged social networking so you can see that it does trail off with generations. So this is, this is the collection of people that we are serving. And we need to do better uh, to give them control of their own computing. So what's happened that we can exploit to make a difference? Because the world's not like it was 40 years ago. Um, even 20 years ago, we found things by indexing into edited content. Um, we did line-by-line -line programming. We made periodic releases of systems about as often as they now release iPhones. Um, it was purely about code. The developers were professionals, and the users were trained. You had to get a training course before you were allowed to use the software system. Imagine that. <laughs> then we had video games which demonstrated that people could use very sophisticated systems without any training, and they learned something that we still don't uh, pay much attention to. So what's happened? Well, a big thing that has happened is that we no longer find things by looking things up in indexes, which means that we don't wait, need to wait for someone to create the index before we can find things. Search has completely changed the way that we access information. Uh, but incompletely, which I will come to in a moment, uh, programming is not so much about laying down lines of code as it is about composing parts and orchestrating their joint behavior. 
um, the notion of periodic releases has kind of given way to continuous updates. And, and in fact, continuous updates that are forced on me without my acquiescence. Um, pure code, that is programmed as things that compute mathematical functions, has given way to software that is deeply embedded in social activities. I mean, think about eBay. eBay isn't just a place to list things for sale and make transactions. The thing that makes eBay eBay is the people who come to eBay to buy, to sell, to defraud, to encourage, to fake reputations, all of the good and all of the bad together. The people behaving as people um, together with the software is what makes eBay. So that's a system that has people embedded as components, and people don't behave like code users. Um, so that, that's a significant change. And then, as I said a moment ago, professional developers are, are actually dominated by casual developers, and, uh, and they're naive users everywhere. So I don't think this changes the fundamentals, but they have to change the challenges and the applications of the fundamentals. Now, how do we transmit design knowledge? Um, well, historically, you know, word of mouth, training and procedures, manuals, handbooks, textbooks, all these big things that have to be written, edited, curated, uh, filed in libraries, found, looked up things in. Um, we still use word of mouth. We still use rules of thumb. There's still some training and procedures, at least among professional programmers. Um, Manuals, not so much, although there are still some of those six inch thick uh, how to use language of your choice books floating around. Um, we can't have handbooks. You know, I had a handbook of chemical engineering. It's eight and a half by 11 by <coughs> four, uh, printed in two point type on Bible paper. And it has everything a chemical engineer needs to know to get started. The curriculum's are organized the same way as the book. And it's issued about every 15 years. But that doesn't work for us. Uh, we still use textbooks and tutorials. Our standards are relatively weak. Um, journals are good for disseminating research, but they don't really reach practitioners. And trade-off guidance is just largely missing. Um, so we need to think about ways to bring codified knowledge to design. And just telling people work harder or think more carefully isn't going to work. We have uh, some modern vehicles. We have tools that embody knowledge. We have frameworks and skeletons. Design patterns help. But I think the big problem, and I said I'd come back to search being incomplete. A lot of the search that's used to find knowledge about software is searching self-help forums like Stack Overflow, where we have the blind leading the blind. And we need to do something about either manually or automating, automatedly, wow, that's a word, uh, curating the stuff in which search is done. Uh, so that search is done over um, uh, accurate rather than anecdotal uh, information. Data mining might help here. So our missing tools are proper documentation. That's always been a problem. Um, guidance for choosing among designs. Uh, I've already complained about that. Um, search in well-curated knowledge bases, well-curated, validated. Uh, this is what's going to replace handbooks, because that can turn over as fast as we need it to. Um, and I, I hold out hope uh, for some kind of automated synthesis of, of related knowledge, so that, that we send engines that do better than just keyword searching out to try to pull together the things that, that work together. OK, so I've been talking about engineering as if it were monolithic. Um, I want to <coughs> moderate that a little bit. Uh, I think it's interesting to lay out software systems uh, by asking what degree of oversight is there? Uh, that is, what's the chance that some actual human being is going to notice that something's going wrong and pulling it apart before something happens? Uh, and how bad is it if something happens? So um, Therac 25 is a famous case study of a radiation uh, a treatment machine uh, that had a um, an error in it that allowed uh, an operator to unwittingly um, give a lethal dose of radiation to a patient. Uh, the details are a story that somebody can tell you. Okay, there's manual oversight there, but the consequences were dire and the manual oversight failed. Um, I don't 
care if Google search misses the most important thing. You know, I don't care if the restaurant finder doesn't find the best restaurant as long as I don't starve. Um, I don't care about automatic sports statistics. Uh, I think the high school football games in, in, uh, in, in the United States are largely reported with, uh, with little programs that get the game statistics and turn them into pros. Um, but up in the other corner there, we have this new power plant shut down, and I really do care about that, even though it's automatic. Okay, so I think there's a, there's a gradient that goes up and to the right in which we care more about the quality of engineering as we go up and to the right. You know, I don't so, I don't so much mind if, if people hanging around in the basement or turning, turning out apps that run on cell phones that have no particular consequence. Um, I do care uh, about stuff that becomes safety critical and stuff that, uh, that becomes fully automated. And when thinking about this, remember that a lot of the applications here migrate from right to left so that the automobile cruise control that I used in the 1980s is giving way to very advanced cruise control and into self-driving cars. <coughs> so you can't just say, cruise control is over here, I don't need to worry about it, and then make it more and more and more sophisticated. <coughs> uh, you have to watch out for that. Okay, so wrapping up, um, I think our big challenge um, is to go beyond the frontier mentality. We've been talking about the electronic frontier, about how we're cowboys on the electronic frontier. We're explorers, we're adventurers. It's time to civilize the frontier. So what does civilization mean? Civilization <coughs> involves having infrastructure and amenities, you know, running water, sewer, um, highways, courthouses, rule of law, libraries, um, operas, uh, schools. Uh, civilization means civil order. Um, shared obligations, rule of law, um, those are things that we are still woefully lacking, as it says in the paper this morning. Uh, civilization involves uh, making citizens able to manage their own affairs, which means making the uh, machinations of software understandable in ways that they can actually react to and manage and feel in control of and make decisions about. Um, it involves uh, cultural clarity on uh, personal security and responsibility um, and, and, and making certain kinds of behaviors <coughs> just unthinkable. Um, and one of the things that I think um, is possibly a tool to, to move us in that direction um, is to rethink product quality, warranty, and liability. Has anyone actually read a software license recently? Okay, that's half the problem there. Um, what you will find in it boils down to, um, I am a company hereby warrant that I am legally entitled to sell or rent this to you, uh, and whatever happens is on you, not on me. A and by the way, you can't, uh, you can't copy this and use it for something else. So that, that's about what's in the software warrant. Okay. If that were turned around so that, uh, so that there was liability involved, uh, then the resource allocations in companies might be better directed uh, toward making the product more like uh, what counts as product in any other domain. Um, so we need policy that's informed by technology. Uh, we need implementations that are really informed by societal needs. Uh, and we need a widespread understanding of technology that, that makes citizens at large uh, literate about, uh, about how decisions are made. With that, I would like to thank all of the people who have suffered through as my co-authors at one time or another. Um, and um, here's the re recapitulation of the story. The important part is, this is how engineering evolves. I told you two stories about how that happens. Uh, one about an engineering discipline that has evolved, one that's close to home and still evolving. Um, and so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention, and uh, I leave you. Thank you very much. Okay, there will be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask one question about the role of adversaries. Uh, in your example in civil engineering, we don't have somebody trying to blow up a bridge every time we try to build it. Whereas in software, 
Uh, that seems to be exactly what happens. As soon as we start, we have adversaries. Does this uh, speed up the move towards an engineering uh, approach, or is this uh, just going to lead to, to chaos along the way? Um, good question. First, first, I want to muddy the premise. Um, back before there were uh, fire departments, uh, there were fire protection societies. And uh, there might be several of them in one area. But the idea was if you wanted someone to come help put out the fire in your house, if your house was burning down, you had to buy up front a membership in the Fire Protection Society. And you got a, you got a, a, a ceramic plaque to put on the front of the house. And um, if your house was burning down and that fire department wasn't there, tough luck. Well, there were competitions among fire departments in which the, uh, the uh, opposing fire department might try to prevent you from getting there or might set fires to try to bankrupt you or so that there were there were adversarial situations. Okay, I'm grasping at straws, but, but there are straws to grasp. Um, no, I don't think people were so much trying to uh, uh, to burn down bridges, but the adversarial behavior has certainly been there. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that springs to mind is when the, uh, when the United States was growing westward from the East Coast, uh, there was a territory, uh, Oklahoma specifically, um, that uh, had land available and was going to make the land available to the public. And the idea was that everybody would line up for the starting line and the gun would go off, the uh, starter signal would go off, and everybody could, could gallop out west <coughs> uh, and try to stake out some plot of land on which they would... Uh, build a home and attempt to farm or ranch or something and make a living off it. And uh, there was a lot of adversarial behavior there, including cheating on the starting line and going out and staking out the uh, prime property earlier. Um, so, so that kind of thing is part of human nature. Um, bridges are certainly targets in wartime. You know, in, in Pittsburgh, the bridge at Port Perry, nobody, nobody knows where Port Perry is. Um, if you follow the Monongahela River southeast from Pittsburgh to where uh, Turtle Creek comes into it, which is uh, where the Edgar Thompson Works is, the, the, only, the only steel mill that's still running in Pittsburgh, um, there's a collection of railroad bridges across the Monongahela and Turtle Creek at that point um, that were a prime strategic location in World War II. Um, that and the hot metal bridges that connected the the ironworks to the steelworks, which were at, at times on opposite sides of the river. And there was, there was serious concern about the possibility that those would be sabotaged or bombed, um, and they were, they were protected carefully. So uh, there is some adversarial right, behavior. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much.